not a comic book. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Comic Reviews, and we've got another big night. The stack isn't getting any smaller, people, as the show's got more views, I've been doing the thing with Cap, I've been adding books when I wanted to take them away, and it's just, ah, uh, it's, it's a real pain to deal with. Um, well, I'm really overexposed. This is what we call professional YouTube content creation. Where we hope that just doing that will make me less exposed on film. Good enough. Sorry for people that are watching this after the fact and dealing with this level of unprofessionalism, but you know what? I'm doing it live, so things are just different. Got a new set of rules when you're doing a live broadcast. All right, so let's talk about the books we'll be discussing tonight. The very last thing that I'll get discussed, or well, no, I shouldn't start with the last thing. I should do this in order like I had just planned to. Okay. Well, let me start again. Uh, the very first thing we're discussing briefly will be this free comic that's like, uh, it's it's basically a 22-page ad. We'll get into that so that you have that to look forward to. Then we got Jonah Hex, Yosemite Sam, number one, followed by Suicide Squad, number 20. Wonder Woman, number 25. Batman Beyond, number 9. Renata Jones Freelancer, number 2. Secret Empire, number 5. Batman, Elmer Fudd, number 1. And then we'll be ending off the night again with Tom King. Tom King will be discussing... The Vision, Volume 2. Okay. Uh, let me say to the people watching live, for some reason my chat doesn't seem to be working. I'll try refreshing it one more time before I get into the reviews here. But, oh, yep, there we go. Maybe. Yay. Uh, okay. So we're good, we're good. Um... It was weird. Chat was, was acting up, but it seems like it's good now. Hi, Matthew Bennett. Hi, Red Leader. Thanks for joining. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with this, which is a promotional... It's it's literally a 22-page ad. Uh, this is Schick Hydro and the Transformers. Schick Hydrobot and the Transformers. Um... So this is literally like you you have those those chic razor commercials where the razor is like a robot for whatever reason and they just decided to put this into a a comic book with the transformers and I got it for free so of course I had to read it I mean if it had just been a reprint or a preview uh, that would have been like, no, I'm not going to read that. But like, it's an actual story. They actually told a story with the Schick Hydrobot <laughs> and the Transformers teaming up. And they at no point try to like make this not exactly what it is. This is amazing. I got to read this line. Oh, man. Okay, hold on, hold on. I got to find it. A mechanical beard? What sort of technology could possibly trim that? It's talking about the Transformer. It's like a war guy or something. He's like a GI truck, and he's got the mechanical beard. I'd recognize it anywhere, my enormous mechanical friend. It's called Hydro Serum, and it belongs to the greatest loss I've ever suffered. Perhaps I should introduce myself. I am Dr. Hiroshi ben Benson, head of the Schick R&D Laboratory. I have dedicated my life to the pursuit of mankind's most important goal, building the perfect razor. <laughs> Dr. Holocron kind of has it. Still better than Transformers 5. I'll take your word for it, man. <laughs> This is just silliness. So, like, the 
Autobots chase down the Shik Razor because they feel they think that, oh man, it's a Decepticon, obviously, like one of Megatron's spy bots. Then they realize it's it's a tiny little hero uh, that, that saves him. And they go, oh, we misjudged you. We've, we'll never think that way of you again. And then the Decepticons show up and start fighting, and the Shik Hydrobot comes in and and fights with with the Autobots against the Decepticons, and he and Bumblebee do cool stuff together, and the Decepticons have to retreat because they weren't prepared for this, in the words of Megatron. <laughs> and then as the sun comes up, the Shik Razor insists on getting back to the apartment in which he's been living for the last six months so he can give his owner a proper shave in the morning. That's that's what this was. Look at that. That many pages about the Autobots teaming up with the Schick Razor. That's just... And then we get like concept art or we get the the sketches like they they really put into this like it's some kind of major thing i'm like guys you made a 22 page commercial i don't understand why they're treating it like it's such a big deal what's next fucking thomas from um the the nfl like ads on the side of the screen the the transformer robot guy why not? Why not? Why not break more boundaries, Transformers? You know, I hear great things about the Transformers comics, and I hate to say it, and I'm probably going to get crucified in the comments for this. This is the very first Transformers comic I have ever read, and it does not bode well. <laughs> I understand it's commercial. It's a movie tie-in thing, but still, guys, come fuck on. Oh man. Alright, let's let's get on to real stuff. It's Jonah Hex, Yosemite Sam, number one. Uh this was a really interesting one, because I've been in a weird place with these these Looney Tune DC crossovers. Uh it's like Doing it as two stories, I think, is a cool idea, and, and having one be very much an all-ages story is fine. But on some level, I still feel like if you were using the Looney Tunes characters, characters that, even though they have a lot of jokes that are kind of above kids' heads and, and aimed at adults, they're still characters that children identify with. And so... If, kid goes to the comic store with their dad and their dad buys them this without knowing who Jonah Hex is for whatever reason. Um, they're likely to read the whole thing. And that's not inherently a problem with them reading the, the part that's not all ages and all the other comics. Uh, this issue is pretty harsh um they're like there's it's it is a jonah hex book um like even even from the get-go that's jonah hex carrying a dead body behind him on a horse or dragging a dead body behind him on a horse and then there's like what a couple pages later you see a guy's head get blown off with a shotgun. And I don't really have any problem with using these kinds of story concepts in a Joan Hex story, but with throwing the Looney Tunes characters in there, that's um that's a bit out there in my book. And I mean like it's not even just stuff surrounding Jonah Hex. This book opens with the Yosemite Sam shooting guys and you can see the blood. That's a bit much. And then there's like, it's not even just the graphic visuals. There's some um, 
pretty risque dialogue in here. I gotta find it. Yosemite Sam, as a prospector, strikes gold, and so he goes into town and gets some um, money for his claim. And as you do when you strike gold in the Old West, you make a beeline straight for the whorehouse. Uh, as, as Yosemite says, Well, I'm uh, going to treat myself to a fine repast and a good washing. Maybe throw in some company if you get my meaning. And then, like, he's having a conversation with this woman who is bathing him. And she says, or he says, yay, I'm going to tame me, Betsy. And she goes, me? Tame Yosemite Sam, the roughest, toughest he man, stuffness hombre that ever crossed the Rio Grande. And he, Sam says, You said a mighty mouthful, lady. And she says, Speaking of which, that was a blowjob joke in a book with Yosemite Sam. That was a joke about Yosemite Sam getting a blowjob. Raise your hand if you feel that is appropriate for children. <laughs> I'm usually not this guy that gets on this whole, that's just not something that's like, this is by no means at all intended for uh, for any kind of all ages audience. Like there's an all ages story in the back, but it is short. This uses its page count, but like, I don't understand why they felt the need to, <laughs> to have that tone like I don't like it, it's a fun idea to have Jonah Hex and Yosemite Sam crossover, but like this is very much a Jonah Hex story. Um, this should not be something that that kids can read. Um, Grady Child says, "Imagine what they'll do with Elmer Fudd and Batman," and we'll get to that. But it's not even kind of the same thing. Uh, Jonah Hex is a very violent character. I mean, it's. Fucking half his face is missing. Um, and and it's just like, that's a really, really, uh, you know, weird tone to have with, Yos with Yosemite Sam in it. I feel like, and it's not just Yosemite Sam, Foghorn Leghorn's in this book too. I expected this to be like one of the more fun kind of things. Um I don't know. That was that was really shocking. This reads just fine as a Jonah Hex story. I want to say that. Um, it's like, hmm. I loved like everyone talks about how awful the new Fifty Two was, and sure, complain all you want. There was plenty of bad in it to complain about, but like a lot of the books I was reading in New Fifty Two were just fantastic. And All-Star Western with Jonah Hex was definitely one of them. Um, and this very much has a very similar tone to that book. Uh, you know, Foghorn Leghorn being a, a man-sized rooster notwithstanding. Seriously, Booster Gold was in that book. Swamp Thing was in that book. Uh... <laughs> Great Child says, how did half of his face get fucked up? Cut himself shaving. Um, anyway. So the story here, though, is that Yosemite Sam strikes gold. He can't trust his partners. They try to kill him, so he, you know, defends his life uh, right away and then goes into town and sees Jonah Hex and is like, hey, I want to hire you to protect me while I mine my gold. Uh, along the way, he runs into Foghorn Leghorn, who he saves his life. Foghorn Leghorn is in a traveling circus, and he fights people that want to challenge the Rooster Man. Again, this is too graphic for a kid to pick up, in my opinion. 
Like, I feel like this is going to make them afraid of Jonah Hex and Yosemite Sam and Foghorn Lakehorn. Um, so anyway, Foghorn Lakehorn uh, learns of a plot from the circus ringleader to go after Yosemite Sam and Jonah Hex and, and steal the gold. And so they have to hold up in a cabin. Foghorn Leghorn manages to warn them in time. Oh, speaking of the new 52 book, there was a nice callback to it with this panel. I thought that was really cool. To Lula Black. Um, but anyway, so Foghorn Leghorn warns them in time. And Jonah Hex goes out to, like, kill the bad guys who are coming to, uh, to attack Sam. And we get, again, some very violent imagery that totally fits Jonah Hex, but not Looney Tunes. Uh, you know, Looney Tunes, you get your face blasted and you're fine. Um, this, not so much. This is, this is pretty bleak. Uh, anyway, the, the, Jonah Hex manages to keep him safe. Um, everyone lives and not, except the bad guys. And Yosemite and Foghorn and Lakehorn go into business together mining gold. And Jonah Hex rides off into a sunset. Which, I never talk about this. Riding off into a sunset, terrible idea. Never ride off into a sunset. Because you're only going to get a couple miles away from town before nightfall. And then guess what? you got to camp outside of town. Why would you do that? Why would you leave the place where you can, you know, get shelter and everything safely. Why would you leave town right before nightfall? Foolish. Foolish. Uh, and then we get the, uh, the backup, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but basically, Yosemite Sam is hunting a rabbit in the woods. Jonah Hex shows up, tells him he's looking for a bounty on a bear. Um, the bear attacks them. Bugs Bunny shows up briefly and helps them. And Jonah Hex captures his bear, and then Sam runs off chasing Bugs. Not a very good backup. It's very Looney Tunes-esque, uh, as random as it is. But this is just not an okay... not an okay thing to do. Like, I am... I like this as a Jonah Hex fan, but I just know a kid read this and is going to be afraid of Jonah Hex now. That's just what's going to happen. Like, there are just panels in this. I gotta find it. Like, the first time we see Jonah Hex... Look at this page. That's just scary, especially this panel down here. That's terrifying. <laughs> um, it's Kids are going to be afraid of this. And I get it, it's not meant for kids, but I don't feel like you should use the Looney Tunes if it can't be on some level enjoyable or readable for kids. Like, I feel like these... I feel like the Wonder Woman one, I feel like the Legion of Superheroes one uh, perfectly captured the right tone to use for these, where it's not like necessarily, a, it's it's a good blend of a superhero story with Looney Tunes character. Um, this is by all means a Jonah Hex story. This is not at all a Yosemite Sam story. Um, yeah. Uh... To be fair, how do you sugarcoat Jonah Hex, is what Dr. Holocron says. And I don't... I'm not sure that you need to. Um, you can have Jonah Hex just defending Yosemite Sam in a very cartoon way. You could have Yosemite Sam be the one Jonah Hex is going after. Uh, you don't have to have it be so just blatantly violent. Um... Like, it would have been really easy for Yosemite Sam to be an outlaw in this story, for Jonah Hex to be trying to collect his bounty, and 
for Yosemite Sam to completely blow all of his bullets in like two seconds, because that's what he did, and Hex to have the drop on him, and choose to collect his bounty, or, or have his bounty be that he's only wanted alive. Um, and then you could have done like a, a dragged across the country thing, and just told a fun story with dialogue, maybe have Hex have to fight off some other bounty hunters that are after him, maybe that's how you could put Foghorn Leghorn in it. Um, just stuff like that, I, I feel, would have been more appropriate than than what we got. Uh, it did not need to be this violent. It did not need to use this kind of um, kind of tone in in some of its jokes. Like certainly, there are plenty of sex jokes in Looney Tunes, um, but there's a line, and I feel this crossed it. I'm putting them up wrong way. All right, let's go ahead and move on to Suicide Squad, number 20. Uh, what's the story here? Amanda Waller is trying to decide who should be the next leader of the Suicide Squad now that Rick Flagg is dead. Spoilers, Rick Flagg is dead. Why don't you know that? Well, I haven't been reading this book, so... Anyway, Ian, if you haven't been reading this book... Why did you pick it up at issue 20? Red Leader Antilles says. Ian, why are you reading this? I'm reading it for that. Steven Sejic uh, is working on this book, and he is easily one of my favorite artists working in comics. Uh, he looks great. It's gorgeous. Every single panel is beautiful. Um, there's just no way around that. Um, I talked about him with the Aquaman book. That's why I'm picking up Aquaman. This is why I'm picking up Su uh, this issue of Suicide Squad. He's only doing this issue. But, I mean, look at this panel of Harley Quinn. That's awesome with, like, this, this image of the Joker. Um, Shatner. Uh, Dean become Shatner. Uh, look at this image of Harley Quinn, though. Like, and I love just the way this looks. Where Amanda Waller's talking about like how she feels about Harley Quinn. She goes, now, however, she is angrier, more dangerous, gone to a dark place, her psychosis enhanced, hints of her ex-lover returning. I just, oh, I love Stephen Sajic's approach to Harley Quinn. He has a great voice for the character. And even though he's not writing this, a lot of that comes through. A lot of that same style is coming through in the art and just the way he's drawing her. Like, I love this image right here of how just, like, removed she is and these creepy drawings of the Joker behind her. Um, it's... Beautiful. Like, I don't even care that it's, like, the movie designs. I mean, it's very clearly meant to be the movie designs. Like, look right there. You know, croc in the, in the thing. Um, I'm not entirely sure that CJ doesn't deserve some level of a writing credit on this. Because a lot of these... Uh, a lot of this, this section in particular of Croc and Enchantress, June Moon out on a date um, are just so hilarious and totally his style. So Waller just lets uh, Croc and June Moon go out on a date in New York City as like shore leave. And so they're all lovey-dovey having a good time, but just in the background you see all these people freaking out. It's like, oh my god, help! It's a giant crocodile man! Call the cops! Shoot it! Shoot it! And then it's just like everybody's like freaking out. And then there's just like this this panel. This is so, so uh, Sejic style of humor. Right here, this lady uh, over here on the corner of the panel. Will somebody please shoot it? For the love of God, shoot it! Shoot it! <laughs> and no one does! That's so his style.
style of humor. And like, I love the way this dude does couples. It's always so fun. He really just has like a, a great ability to draw people having fun together. And it's, it's hilarious. Like, look at this image. It's Killer Croc taking a selfie. Why is a cannibal allowed to walk around this on the street? Because he's in a relationship and it's his chance to be out on a date. Um, <laughs> these two are adorable together. Uh, and then like, I don't know, just this whole section. If he didn't write it, he knew exactly how to do like convey it. I love how expressive Sejic is with his uh with his character's um facial expressions. Uh it's a preacher ad on the back of all the DC comics, man. Anyway, uh like you know there's just so much look at this lady's face here. There's so much terror and dread. It, it feels like reading old horror comics when I look at some of his art. There's so much conveyed in these expressions. He's really, really good about that. I've heard him or read him talk about how he does his, his facial expressions. Um, and it has to do with, like, he's talked briefly about it, but, like, he learned to do facial expressions by getting a background in animation, which makes a lot of sense because animation, you have to figure out how to get the most expression with the smallest amount of detail. So he does that for the base and then he just builds on top of it as he adds more detail. So it creates these really, really great expressive faces for him. And man, does it pay off. And then there's just like, he he's the artist and colorist because he does digital painting. Um, and so much of that looks great. He's really into the whole fantasy thing. And it really comes through in this scene with Enchantress. And also this scene with Enchantress is hilarious. She takes a poor... She, she wants to get some, um, some freelance work as an artist, a uh, graphic artist, um, while she's in New York. And she can do it while she's in Belle Reve. And she goes into like the last guy in New York that that might accept her stuff, and you just see this this panel of like skyscraper, mortal fools, comes out in the full enchanter gear. Blind mortal fools, you would deny June Moon's talents in the field of freelance graphic design? So be it. Then the Isle of Manhattan shall suffer the Bible black eldritch talents of the enchantress. <laughs> <laughs> and the Enchantress's talent is mortal death. <laughs> like, why couldn't this have been the Suicide Squad movie? <laughs> oh, man. Oh. Uh. So, like, I love this this relationship between Enchantress and Killer Croc, because Killer Croc goes and gets one of these uh, executives that own a graphic design firm and just, like, kidnaps him and makes him say that he'll start accepting some of June Moon's work. And th that, that makes her stop being the Enchantress, and she's so in love with Croc for doing that for her. <laughs> oh... That was fun. Um, and then we get the big reveal, which is that Harley Quinn is now going to be the leader of the Suicide Squad because of reasons, continuity, whatever. And we set up the villain for the next arc, but Sejic's not returning, so I don't particularly care. Again, here's a great uh, look at... Um, a look at Harley... Uh, Sejic's work on expressions. Look at the expression on this face versus the one on the opposing page. Two wildly different emotions really captured here. You got this shock and mixed with dread, and then you have this an anger coming out. And then, like, just the way this paneling looks is really, really cool. 
Uh, you ever, you know, going to attack, then katana blocking, and it's like the, the cards behind her is really, really neat. Uh, Harley suit is decent. It's a good mix between New 52 whore Harley and, like, you know, the classic Harley costume. Um, it's, it's a, it is acceptable. Uh, I will say... I did about Steven's art uh, from last time, and you're gonna have to give me a minute because I'm actually gonna look it up and and try to be. Um... Wait, wait. Why is Katana not in charge? They explained it in the beginning, and I I can't really give you much of a reason. I I didn't care to be perfectly honest. Um, let's see here. No, damn it. Uh, I wish there was a way I could tell who I'm following. Hold on. I don't know, I need Sunstone. I gotta find this guy's face in in his other work. Um, now I've got all the BDSM cosplayers coming up, but none of the art. Really? Really? More? I don't know. Not newest. Um... Digital art. Let's try that. Oh my god, this is ridiculous. I cannot believe it's going to be this hard to find the guy's thing. DeviantArt is not a very well-organized site. Um, hold on. One more second. Sorry. Sorry. I know this is just the ultimate level of professionalism. But I do want to actually try to make my point. <laughs> okay, there's his main DeviantArt. Now I need to find his um, secondary account. Uh, where is it at? God. Okay, here we go. Alternate account. And now i got to find an image of... I think his name's Alan. I can never remember the character's name off the top of my head. Oh. Because he's the main character of the new new volume, so that shouldn't be too difficult to find. Uh, Mercy, Chapter 1. This looks like a pretty good look in his face. Okay. All right, let me get some screen sharing going on here. Again, sorry for the ultimate level of professionalism here. Oh, what am I doing? Screen share. Okay, so here's the character from that was initially introduced in Sunstone and continues to be uh, and is is beginning to be the star of the new series Mercy that Sejik's doing. Um, not like a super unique character design or anything. It's a guy with red hair, a bit of a bushy beard. And, you know, nothing, like, super unique about him in, in any huge way. Let me stop screen sharing. Okay. Ugh. There's his design for Captain Boomerang. I mean, it's the same character, right? There's no, there's no like level of this that's 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 not the same character design, just in a different costume. Um, I don't know. Um, that's just like one of those things. Where I'm like, that is a little. It's a corner cut because Captain Boomerang's not in a ton of this, but at the same time, it's a little cheap. Uh, it's it's just a little bit of too much of a, a reuse. Um, and so stuff like that kind of bothers me. Um, otherwise, like people are asking, why is Katana with the squad? And like they kind of explain it, but I don't. Like, they, they give a whole thing of 
No, that's not it, Tutsu. Why do you want to stay? You claim to talk to the dead people in your sword, including your husband. You allow ghosts to advise you. The reason you want to stay here is it's the only place you can feel at home. Uh, among the crazies. I mean, I just... I don't particularly care about the motivations for the characters or anything. I bought this for the art, and the art did not disappoint. Um, it's Tatsu, not Titsu. Well, fucking goddamn, man. I don't read Katana. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know every single DC character's name. My bad. Anyway. It's really good-looking art, though. Um, and I just, I bought it for the art, so I was not disappointed by that. I think he even snuck in some of his own work, because we get a look at June's, um, portfolio, and it's got a lot of this, like, fantasy stuff in it, and that's just something that he, he does a lot of, is, is fantasy art. Um, I highly recommend following him on DeviantArt if you have an account, or just on Twitter, he posts a lot of stuff there, too. Uh... Let's see here. N e b e z i a l is his DeviantArt, and you can just uh, Google s e. If you Google search s e j i c, uh, his Twitter account is the first thing that comes up. So I highly recommend following this artist. Cool guy, fun stuff, um, but just gorgeous work, and definitely worth your time to check out. Go ahead and move on. To Wonder Woman number twenty-five. Uh, <laughs> so my big complaint from last issue was I didn't get why she lost the golden lasso and what are what are we doing with that? Um, in this issue she gets the golden lasso back, but like. I don't really get why. Um, it has an explanation. It has a moment. I feel like I'm just not getting enough of it because I've I've not read the whole run again um, up to this point, and I, I probably should. That'd be that maybe an episode or, or something. Uh, like, it feels like this moment has a lot of significance and stuff, but it just doesn't really mean all that much to me right now. Uh, so this just kind of was passable for me. Like, there's this big lead-up to this moment, and all it is is her getting the lasso... Because she's all angry in the beginning of the book because she doesn't have the lasso anymore and she's she's angry at the gods. And then at the end she gets the lasso back and she goes home and has sex with Steve Trevor. I mean, if I got the lasso of truth back, I'd probably go home and have sex with Steve Trevor too. So, can't blame her, but at the same time I'm just like, it's not a bad issue. I don't want to give that impression. I just... If this is it, if this is Rucka's last issue, I'm not sure I fully appreciate it now in the single as if I would in a... a you know, run. Um, I, I don't know. I'm going to have to go back and read this buy issues. I'm not going to get this in trade because it's written for trade, but it's not. It's it's both written as a long form single story and yet it is broken up in such a way that if you're not reading it by issue number one month at a time or by issue number back to back to back, then it's not going to make sense. Um I don't I don't know what else to tell you. Uh 
that's that is problematic comic writing um this should have been two ongoings it shouldn't have as drastically been tied together or at the very least the year one stuff with wonder woman should have been more cohesive and and told its own story that is not completely dependent like all the year one stuff is good but all it does is set up the the current stuff all it does is serve to set up wonder woman with an origin but also set up the the current ongoing it is the most nolanized way of telling a story in comics and that is not a format that is good for comics um so what's weird is like you you need a 25 issue thick ass book that's the only way to read this collected uh if you get this get it by issue or if you get the different trades however many volumes they break it up into read one chapter of one and then another chapter of the other and that's a bad way to to read trades um so yeah let's go ahead and continue on to batman beyond number nine sorry i don't have much to say about wonder woman i just I, it, it was so non-reactionary to me and it continued to have the whole the same problem all the way through anyway batman beyond number nine pretty much exactly what i wanted in all honesty uh we get an explanation for what happened to damian wayne in the beyond universe and we get some brothers fighting and it's adorable uh I don't know, it's just kind of cool to see Damien and Terry fighting one another. Uh, and then Bruce fights Ubu, so we get a cool callback. Or Ubu's, Ubu's child. Bruce fights Ubu's uh, son. And that was, that was a cool callback to the animated series. But like, I don't know. This is just fun. This is exactly what I was hoping it would be. It's, it is passable entertainment, and it is neat. And Damien's a badass who just cannot deal with the fact that his father has other kids. Uh, Red Leader Antilles wants to know: Is the cover a fucking lie again? Spoiler alert. No. The cover is not a lie. The cover is not a lie. Um, n no, Ubu's son does not allow Bruce to go through a door. Uh, but I don't know. It's really neat to see Damien fighting the Batman Beyond costume and doing so damn well. Uh, like not, not just like he's holding his own or anything. He is destroying Terry, which is exactly how that fight should go. Uh, this is totally the older brother picking on the little brother, which is a nice role reversal for Damien in a weird way. Cause he's usually the youngest. Um, We get a flashback for explaining what happened to Damien. And I like that this new suit, it's not going to stick around and say that. Um, I like that this new suit is actively driving the story here. Because the reason that Damien left is not because he didn't exist yet when Batman Beyond was made. The reason Damien left is he took the prototype suit to go be Batman and stop Ra's al Ghul uh, from invading Gotham, but the suit sent him into overdrive and fundamentally changed him, and that drove him away from Bruce. That's a really cool idea, and that's, that's interesting because it's what seems to maybe could be, maybe be what, yeah. 
it seems it could maybe be what's going to happen to Terry here, where he has done the exact same thing that Damien did. He put on the suit, went and fought the League of Assassins, and it is pushing him beyond his limits. Um, there's this really great exchange uh, between the suit and Terry. i got to see if I can find it. Uh, now that's beforehand. Okay. The suit tells him, for you to prevail, lethal means will be required. And Terry's response is, if that's what it takes, so be it. Uh, that's really neat. Um, Red's asking, so Terry is still Bruce's son because he hates that? Um, not necessarily. I had this conversation with Cap. This story doesn't seem to be taking place um, post the establishment that Terry is Bruce's son. Um, but the thematic implications of that plot point in Justice League Unlimited are very much here. Um, that is very much what's going on with uh, some of the subtext between Damien and Terry interacting. So take that for what you will. But I really like this moment of the suit telling him lethal force is required to defeat Damien. Um, and Terry just going, yeah, let's do it. The suit like fucks with you and changes your mind. And that's why Bruce scrapped it. I like that idea. That's neat. That's like kind of a classic sci-fi trope. It kind of goes to why Batman wasn't a fan of technology um that that augmented his strength something we kind of dealt with in the uh the last issue of or no not the last issue the issue prior to the last issue batman number 24 um you know we dealt with why doesn't batman fly and of course batman beyond did so i don't know this was this was a neat idea. These these are well done issues. They're fun. They're cool. And there's always it's like he is he's got a a thing for it. There's always a great last page, even if it's super obvious. <laughs> like that's cool as shit. <laughs> this is why super heavy sex balls. Well, that and the other reasons, pretty much. Uh, but man, that's just neat. Uh, I like this. Admittedly, the speakers are a little weird out of context. <laughs> Damien's gonna kill Terry because he dissed his awesome sound system. My bases are pumping. You don't understand. <laughs> Let's use the brotherly context. I told you never to come into my room. <laughs> I can do this all fucking night. Whew. Okay. The reason for the speakers is Damien anticipated and planned for this. Very much Bruce's son. Um, and so he set up a trap that uh, involved speakers that broadcast a frequency that interfered with the suit's communication device. Because obviously the suit on some level isn't buttons inside. It's it's some kind of thought-based communication. Um or, or something like that, some kind of HUD. Um, and this was like a signal was broadcast through sound waves that fuck with that. That was cool. I also really like, you know, we're, we're, they're in the comments, they're talking about 
you know, the Batman and armor and stuff like that. This does a really good job of showing why um, Terry is a good Batman, but he's not on Bat on Bruce's level or, or even Damien's, obviously. And he really does depend on the armor. Um, so he goes to punch Damien, and when Damien is, you know, unarmed, and Damien's able to access the utility belt and attack Terry with it. Mm. That was cool. That was really, really neat. Um, it's a pretty solid story, man. I mean, obvious maybe, but, you know, if we're going to put Batman Beyond in DC Comics, we definitely should do some stuff with the characters that, you know, we're... Do you ever think we're going to see Damien in animation outside of the DC movies right now? Like, are they are they ever going to do another Batman animated series where Damien is the Robin? Maybe, but I doubt it. Uh, so this is a good place to experiment with, with ideas like that and, and just have fun. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed this. That was a solid issue. Uh, all right, let's go ahead and move on to Renato Jones' Freelancer. Number two. Um, this is violent. This is scary. Uh, and it's intriguing, as Renato Jones should be. So we get this opening scene where this guy who's rich offers all this money to someone that's stalking him and then gets his face ripped in half. But then we juxtapose that uh, brief after a brief interlude with the villain who's the president and being told by the 1% how to run the country into the ground. A lot of this stuff is just so fucking harsh. Um, in France, you'll declare America exempt from the Paris Treaty. Oil prices will rise and will allow us to flush out some remaining inventory before you later reverse course and pump up sales in solar. <laughs> Here's the thing. Donald Trump's not that smart. It's my only complaint in that scene. Um, but anyway, when we go to Renato, we see that he's actually, oh, I should, I should make a uh, mature content warning since there were tits. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> mm. So f mature content warning, tits. Uh, we see Renato, who's, like, kind of given up and, and is just going to debauchery. Uh, and that's that's just kind of, like, fascinating because it juxtaposes what we see in the beginning with, you know, a man who is rich being killed brutally. Um... Also, penis. Penis uh, is, is shown, too. Just so the ladies have something. Penis. Uh, and so Renato's really dealing with, like, a, you know, crisis of faith. Uh, <laughs> Riddy Child says, they aren't even well-drawn or attractive tits. Uh, this book's not supposed to be... This book is, is definitely not in any way, shape, or form trying to be beautiful art, like Suicide Squad, in my opinion, is. Like, say what you will about the costume designs. The look of this is gorgeous. Um, uh, 
this book is meant to be very crash, very ugly, heavily stylized. The art is meant to be very jarring. Um, that is part of the statement of it is it is not pretty. Uh, it is it is meant to to shock uh, and and overwhelm and kind of forces you to almost look away, which is the point. Um, so uh, we have relationships developing, but mainly Renato is is in a place of self doubt. He's not sure where he's going. Um, so like Frank Miller, yeah, that's a pretty good uh, comparison. Renato isn't sure what he's doing with his life. I love the ads. Obstruction. Obstruction for them. And we show a black person. Subtle. In a good way. Uh, I also like that Renato's actually being drawn kind of like his character at this point. Because he's just so down in the dumps that he's just kind of in a way is becoming his character. Or, or his alter ego, I guess I should say. Which is like, this panel is of Renato without the mask on, but he's just like so drained by everything that's going on um, and directionless in a way that, that he's kind of looking like the freelancer. It's like that that's trying to eat its way out of him. Uh, Get a flashback, and again, he's using kind of like pointillism to show the scenes that are flashback. It's weird because usually when you get a flashback in a comic and you're you're paralleling it with current art, you wouldn't do it this way, but he like straight up just puts the page with all its paneling. Like you could read this page, uh, which is interesting. Um <laughs> And then there's like word balloons over word balloons right there, which is just a trope I generally like. Um, and that was kind of cool to see. <sighs> this was really neat. Like on, on one level, it's kind of, you could make an argument that it's lazy, but I think it's a really unique and fascinating way to do a flashback. Uh, It's, it's just really cool to see see that done. So you have this, like, really iconic, or, yeah, I guess iconic is a fair way to put it, uh, two-page spread from the, the first volume, and you have Renato meeting this character who he hasn't seen since that first issue again, and she's just having a flashback seeing him, knowing who he is. And that's just a really interesting way to communicate that. Oh, and this panel of Renato is so cool. We've met. And, like, that's how she sees him. She knows who he is. That's really neat. Uh, and then uh, he run, she runs away because she's, you know, terrified of him, obviously. And because uh, she doesn't quite know what's up with him. And then he runs after her, but before he can catch up or anything, the bad guy from the first issue shows back up. Exciting. I'm I'm really up for this. I'm loving this series. I think there's there's some interesting commentary. Choke on this, and then we see, you know, the women Renata shacking up with. Um I think there's some really interesting commentary here. In that, I'm trying to think how to put this. Since the election, people who identify as on the left have been, generally speaking, directionless. They've not known how to feel or, or what to do about the state of the country. And, and there's just this sense of like, what are we living in? What is this world? I don't know how to feel. 
there's people reevaluating their values. There are people who who try to stick to this liberalism. Like I've I've seen this stuff where people go, well, 62.3 million people voted for him. They can't all be racist. Yes, they can. Um, but I see this mentality of like we have to listen. We have to give him a chance. We owe it to him as like a because we live in a democracy and, and the people elected him. No, they didn't. Um, like there's there's so many things where it's like people are are reevaluating their values and and Renato has a line where he's kind of explaining what he's going through right now. Uh I've had enough of your games. Haven't you heard? I failed. They won. What were we trying to do? Stop mattering before it started. They own us all. They won, and now they're openly feeding on each other. Not feeding, assimilating. Um, and that's just, uh, I don't know, it's really, really interesting. Uh, commentary on on how he's lost and he doesn't know what to do, and now he sees. Uh... <laughs> Red leader until he's. I was a liberal for like half a year and then become a socialist due to this election. Kudos to Steve and Alex for that. It's funny because you were a conservative before the the period of being a liberal. So good job. <laughs> uh... Um, you really came full circle there, Red. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's just, it's interesting to see the way in which, um, the, the values are being critiqued here. The, the way we think, the, the way we function is being critiqued here. Because uh, you, you do have people on the left trying to cling to liberalism, and yeah, I understand the appeal of it, but there's so much has happened, and it, it happened under your watch. It happened under your, oh, baby steps progressive kind of agenda. Um, what we were trying to do stopped mattering before we started. Uh So I don't know, that's just a, a really poignant, timely commentary is, is I guess the point I'm getting at. And to see the thing that's kind of, maybe it's going to shock him out of it, is someone who he helped. Someone who he helped who's still struggling, but who he saved, when you put it that way. Um, so... I'm very, very impressed, uh, impressed to see what's going to happen here. And I don't, I don't think that bringing the villain from the very first issue that he saved her from was a, back was a, a, you know, thing that he didn't intentionally do. Uh, it it was very much something he is he is aware of the choice that he's making. I, I feel that implication is is very intentional here. Give me one sec, I just need to go turn on a light. It's getting dark. It's what happens when you start comic reviews at night. Comic reviews after dark. I can just like come out in a robe with like a a nice glass. Uh, what do you call that? A hand goblet? Okay. <sighs> so, after talking about a book with some really intriguing politics that do challenge your current conceptions and, uh, and do so in a way that's not disgusting and, and kind of brilliant, let's go to the complete opposite end of that. 
Secret Empire, number five. Oh. Some shit's going on with Natasha and Viper. And the Natasha wants to steal an old man on medical support. I don't know why. Uh, Dreamy Steve and Dreamy Bucky and Dreamy Sam are in the Dreamy Woods together. Um, Tony's trying to get the shard of the Cosmic Cube from Wakanda and Black Panther just says, fuck, no, I'm not giving it to you. You can give me yours, <laughs> which good on Black Panther. Let's not give it to the guy who's going back to America. It's a bad idea. Um, but Tony and team are not having any luck collecting fragments of the cosmic cube. They're getting uh, kind of outwitted by, um, what's her name? Oh, ask me about my feminist agenda. What's her fucking name? I want to say Black Widow. I know that's wrong. What? Isn't it something? Shit. It's like right here, and I just can't. Ah. And I can't find her name anywhere. White Queen. <laughs> Ian, do you even marvel? Mockingbird, thank you. God, how did I fuck that up? I don't know. I guess I shouldn't be doing comic reviews since I can't remember any of these people's fucking names. Um, so she's a spy and she's either stealing the fragments from the Avengers as they try to collect them or before they can collect them and because she's working for Hydra. Why the fuck is Mockingbird working for Hydra? Like of all the characters to be working for Hydra, Mockingbird? Like, I don't even know anything about her. I, like, I, I literally do not know this character. I'm sorry, but I do not know this character. But, like... This feels weird. This is a bad decision, right? Can we all agree this is a bad decision? So the character that got all the hate from fascist men, men's rights groups, men's rights Nazi groups, um, for a cover that said, ask me about my feminist agenda, is, is secretly working for Hydra? I don't know how to react to that, guys. Um, Cap has a conversation with Beast, Hank McCoy, uh, about his ability to pick up Molnir, and he threatens to destroy New Tyan. New Tyan? Tian? However you say, the, the mutant homeland. Um, if they don't give him back the... Uh, shard of the cosmic cube that they have. Okay. Uh, Hank McCoy is an ambassador from the tie-in, so that makes it like... Whatever. I just... I don't even know. Um... Visions 
uh, let's see here. Scarlet Witch is possessed. Vision's being reprogrammed. That's why they're both working for him. Thor's reason is just fucking stupid. There's no, like, way to fix this. This is stupid for why Thor is working for Hydra Cap. He's praying to his father, and he goes, Midgard's politics have always confounded me. I have seen kings and empires rise and fall too many times to care. And in all that time, no mortal has earned my trust in the manner that Steve Rogers has. But I've seen things here, things that trouble me. The innocent being persecuted, evil gaining, fear taking hold. They tell me only they can save Jane Foster from the purgatory where she now resides. Only they can restore this realm's connection to Asgard. I sense the lie in this, but he wielded Molnir. He was proven worthy, even when I am not. I don't understand, Father. Help me, because of what they ask me to do now. So Thor, Thor is, is knowingly working for Hydra. <laughs> Thor is knowingly working for Hydra, even though he knows what they're doing is wrong. All because Steve Rogers picked up Molnir. This book just gets dumber and dumber and dumber. That's all it comes down to. This book just, it is a house of cards all ready to collapse. Um, and then at the end, Mockingbird reveals the location of the rebel base. Uh... And then Dream Steve uh, witnesses Dream Bucky and Dream Sam get knocked out by Dream Red Skull in the Dream Forest. Uh, but yeah. And then even though the, the rebel base is shielded, uh... It's going to be okay because Cap has a weapon to go fight that. He has Bruce Banner Hulk. This is crossing the threshold of being dumb because of its ill thought out politics and moral commentary. And it is now just becoming dumb on a, that makes no sense for why that character would be on that side level of, of just comic book crossover. -y. We're fighting each other now. Like, I'm still trying to figure out why the fuck Frank Castle would be... Uh, no, it's it's Bruce Banner. Bruce Banner Hulk. Uh, it's, it's Bruce Banner, guys. He even says... Oh my fucking god, all these previews. Bruce Banner, it's good to see you again, old friend. Um, but, like... I thought Frank Castle was an awful enough decision. Like, Vision, okay, fine, he's been reprogrammed. Scarlet Witch, okay, fine, she's possessed. It's comics, whatever. Thor? Just because Steve can pick up Mjolnir? Thor, you, you're seeing him run a concentration camp. Again, I'm not going to let this go. Captain America is running a concentration camp. And people are defending him? 
What the shit? <laughs> like, I get it. I really do. The levels to which people will defend Donald Trump are absurd and disgusting. Um, and comic books can comment on those things and exaggerate them to ridiculous extremes, like Captain America ran a concentration camp. For the sake of commentary, fine with that, fine. Whatever, not, not fine with the Captain America part, but, but fine, fine, fine. Government ran concentration camp, okay, okay. Why are our heroes defending this? Why is Thor, I'm troubled by it. Dude, he's fucking running a concentration camp. He is, he is isolated, or, or he's running a concentration camp. He has isolated an entire section of the populace of your friends and co-workers, Thor, in a, essentially a ghetto where they're being attacked day and night by demons. How can you possibly on any level go, well, Monier says it's okay. Is that like some kind of religious commentary? What? Uh. <laughs> I talked a couple issues back about how I thought that maybe there can on some level be an out for all of this. Not anymore. This is just blatantly awful. This is disgusting and lacks any sense of, of decency, any sense of understanding who these characters are. This is totally sacrificing characters for your story, and it's not a good story. And I gave him all the rope, and it's my fault, and he hung me. Um, there's no way in hell this is going to wrap up in any kind of cohesive way that makes it all worth it. That At this point, I'm in it because I'm stuck on the train. I might as well be up front when it wrecks. Uh, Great Child says, It's stupid to me because Donald Trump doesn't even have a concentration camp. If he did, we'd kick him out of office. I mean, you say that, but people defend him for literally anything. Uh, which is what the commentary here is attempting to get at, but it's just so blatantly insulting by having our heroes do it. Uh, Cause I'm sure at this point, There's the most controversial thing I could think to do with a comic book. Um, yeah. I paid like six bucks for that book too, but fuck that book. Uh, I may very well post an issue just burning all the comics. God, that'd be good. That When it all wraps up, I'll probably end up doing that. Because fuck Nick Spencer for that. <laughs> oh, man. <sighs> Going to be happy now. I'm not going to talk about that book for the rest of the night. I'm going to have a good time. I'll buy the next one. Jesus fucking Christ, I'll do it. Because I just, again, I'm on the train. I might as well see it wreck at this point. Uh, 
anyway, let's talk about Batman Elmer Fudd number one. I don't understand the purpose of putting the number one on books like these. Uh, like, it should just say one shot or something as opposed to, like, numbered like a normal comic book. <laughs> um, so this is in juxtaposition to the the um, in juxtaposition to the the Yosemite Sam Jonah Hex crossover, we have Elmer Fudd and Batman, and these are doing very similar things. This is, in a lot of ways, a Batman story. This is kind of like a love letter to, you know, noir-style stuff. Um, Elmer Fudd has an internal monologue in this, and it, it reads so much like, you know, that classic noir detective thing, but just in Elmer Fudd's voice. Sometimes the vein comes down so hard you forget you've ever been to why. That's the very first line of the book. The title of the issue is Play For Me. Sometimes the wane comes down so hard, you forget you've ever been dwy. I try to see it out. I try to see it out there in the past or in the future, rainbows waiting. Going into Porky's that day, I try my best to remember I really do. Things weren't always this way. They won't always be this way. I try my best and the water seeps in, molding my coat onto my shotgun. And I stop twine, and I head inside. My name is Elmer Fudd. I'm hunting wabbits. Shh. So this is like really, this is not Elmer Fudd in the traditional way at all. Um, this is very much meant to be like a, a really kind of tonally shifted take on Hammer Fudd. Um, <laughs> um, where an Elmer Fudd is a hitman, basically, in Gotham. And like they, they tell you that, but they don't really show it, so that's fine. Um, and he's going after a guy named Bugs the Bunny Wolves. <laughs> um, and the reason he's going after him is because Bugs murdered Silver St. Cloud. And so he finds him in this bar where we have all these like gritty real life versions of the Looney Tunes characters. But it's not like they're like overly dark. It's just, okay, what can we do that's like kind of funny and kind of silly? So like we have you know, Sydney Sam who's like a motorcycle gang. Uh like you know, like a motor uh, bike gang. There we go. Um better don't bet varmint, but do it soon, or I'll blast your damn head off. And then we got like Taz who's a bouncer, it's like ah as he's like beating the crap out of someone. Um and then we have Marvin the Martian, who's just this like crazy guy off in the corner of the bar drinking alone. He's like, someday I will blow up the whole world with my Illudium Q36 space modulator. That will surely improve the view. And then as the, the ultimate tonal juxtaposition of that, we have a guy trying to convince everybody that, that Michigan J Frog can sing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, everyone's really happy that Silver's dead. Spoilers. 
Have you been warned about spoilers? Are you ready to be warned about spoilers? She's not dead. Um, so anyway, Bugs gives Elmer the name of the person who hired him to kill Silver St. Cloud. That being Bruce Wayne. And so Elmer goes off to kill Bruce Wayne because Bruce Wayne not only apparently had Silver St. Cloud killed, he did it. He also was the only other man that Silver St. Cloud ever loved. So Elmer comes into a lavish party that Bruce is hosting and shoots Bruce with a shotgun. And all the party guests freak out and, and run away. And Elmer speeds off into the night, but Batman hunts him down. Because, of course, Bruce survived. Batman hunts him down, and we get this just epic-ass fight scene in the hallway. This is so freaking cool. <laughs> oh, man. Oh. Oh, we just get this epic ass action scene. The art here looks so good. And again, it totally fits this gritty noir feel. It looks great, y'all. Um, so we get like shotgun blasts, but importantly, there's no blood. We get violence, but you don't actually see people getting hit. Um we get a lot of like the like this kick's a good example. From this panel, we infer that Batman popped up and kicked Elmer in the chin. But we don't see the connection. We don't see it connect. Same with this. We are not seeing the, the shotgun connect with Batman. We're seeing the aftermath of it. Um, and that's really cool. Uh, And, I don't know, it's just really neat to see that fight. It was cool. It was neat. Uh, so Batman says, what do you know about Silver St. Cloud? And Elmer reveals that Bruce Wayne, or that he has information that Bruce Wayne hired her to kill him. Or was Bruce Wayne hired to kill her to, to take her out? And he did. Um, and then Bruce, or Batman, convinces Elmer that they need to work together because he's sure Bruce Wayne didn't do it. So they go back to the bar and they find Bugs and all the other Looney Tunes characters and there's a big bar fight. Um, big epic fisticuff bar fight with a lot of, you know, there's a little bit, like we get like a tiny bit of blood splatter right there but nothing too massive uh this has more of a connection to the fights but they're all one panel um so it's just it's not as big a deal i guess it just doesn't like there's violence in this but it's not as blatantly gritty uh and and so it's just i would feel fine letting a kid read this but i don't think they'd enjoy it very much you know this feels like something um This, this just feels like something that, that a kid would be kind of bored by. Um, so, anyway, they go through the bar fight and everything, and they ask Bugs why he killed Silver St. Cloud. And Silver St. Cloud shows up and says, he didn't, or he did it because I asked him to. And she reveals that the reason that she uh, set this whole situation up was because Bruce lied to her, and Elmer lied to her, and so she kind of pitted them against each other. And then she gives them this information and walks out the bar, never to be seen again. And we, we close with Elmer's narration. I want her. All I want is her. And I watch her go weaving us behind why does every story have to end 
I couldn't tell you. All I know is everything has a season. You just got to weed the sign. Duck season, wabbit season. Then one day you woke up and you realize this season is yours. That is like the perfect fucking ending. <laughs> I am so in love with that. That is like so it, it's such a just noir ending and it's it's fun. It's funny, it's it's entertaining. Um this was great, man. <laughs> I really, really like this. This is a, a fun issue. Let me get the backup, and this this is one of those backups where it's clearly not um, jumping off of the original story. It's it's just kind of uh, doing its own thing. And so we, we basically just do duck season, rabbit season, but it's bat season, rabbit season, and Bugs, of course, gets to be the victor. Guys, Tom King has an obsession with Batman getting the tar beaten out of him. Just an absolute obsession with it. Like, we just keep seeing Batman get shot in the face with a shotgun. Ugh. It's just like he's trying to reason with Elmer and he just keeps getting shot. Uh, and then uh, I love the ending here because Bugs keeps tricking him and, and, you know, getting him shot. And so Babin goes, all right, all right. Is there any way to stop this? And Bugs whispers in his ear. Okay. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. That, that seems fair. Boys! Then the Robins show up, and Bugs changes the sign to say Robin season. <gasps> and I'm just like, oh my god, this is hilarious. That is the, 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 that's just funny, man. That's just enjoyable. Um, the way this plays was really good. I like the backup. Fun issue. Solid, solid book, man. Really, really had a, a fun time with this. Uh, you know, it is it is really up there for me. Um, the way he, he wrote that, it's just hilarious. I laughed really, really hard uh, reading the, that one. And it, it certainly is not tonally Looney Tunes, but it is not too dark for a kid to read, which I felt was important. Um, okay, folks, speaking of things too dark for a kid to read, The Vision, Volume 2. Guys, this is just sad. Like, I don't... I don't know how to feel anymore. I don't know if there are feelings to be had anymore after this. It's a hard read in like a good way, but it's it is a really hard to get through. You just have so much going on and it sucks. Uh So we get like a flashback of what Vision's relationship with Scarlet Witch was like. And again, I'm not a Marvel fan, so I didn't even know that they had a thing. Uh, we get a flashback of what that was like. And then we get um, why it dissolved and, and how he got the uh, stone to, to have his... To have... Uh, Virginia created. And we open and close this issue with a joke. That's really, really interesting. So we have Vision sitting next to Scarlet Witch after they had sex in bed, and it's really awkward. 
And Vision goes, Janet Van Dyne, the Wasp, recently told me a joke. Would you enjoy hearing it? Two toasters are sitting on a counter. One toaster says to the other toaster and asks, do you fe sometimes feel empty? Then the other toaster says, oh my god, a talking toaster. And in reaction to that, Scarlet Witch actually starts laughing, and then they laugh together. And that's kind of like the basis for their relationship, where it's uncomfortable, and they know it's weird, but somewhere down they just connect. And then we parallel that at the end, where he has his wife Virginia now. And they're sitting in bed together, and he says, two toasters are sitting on a counter. One turn toaster turns to the other and asks, do you sometimes feel empty? Then the other toaster says, oh my god, a talking toaster. And his wife doesn't react. It's just this creepy, uncomfortable, scary image to see. And that's... Ugh. It's just unsettling, y'all. Um, so then we have, what's his name? Shit. Victor, who is basically Vision's brother, another creation of Ultron, comes to live with them for an issue. And he really interacts well with and gets to know the family, and they kind of, they collectively love him. Um, and there's like some talk about a problem he has with vibranium, and he interacts with the, the kids and gets along with them and, and does act like an uncle figure. And then it's all revealed that he's been essentially sent to spy on them by the Avengers to figure out what's been going on. And so he tries to defend himself, or tries to stop Vin from going to tell his father, and in doing so, kills Vin. There's no saving him, there's no nothing. Um... Why do people message me on Skype on Wednesday nights? They know I'm working. <laughs> uh. So, Vision's son dies as a result of order, indirect reaction from the Avengers. And the creepiness, the creepiness. <sighs> this better be important. Um, dude, not right now, man. Um, Just the creepiness and unsettling nature of this scene. A vision clicking a lighter on and off, sitting alone in a dark room. What he got from Captain America. Just intensely thinking. I love this conversation that he has. Wife, our recent home incarceration has provided me with time to think, and I have spent this time thinking about my brother, Victor Mancha. How is Victor alive? How Victor is alive, and my son, Vin, is not. I've run through a number of scenarios, a great number, and I've rigorously applied those scenarios to a variety of philosophical and religious traditions. Despite my efforts, unfortunately, 
I cannot see how in any scenario, in any philosophical or religious tradition, this current outcome is just. I must therefore conclude that it is not just, and what is not just must be addressed. This is true in all scenarios, in all systems. Now I cannot revive our sun, therefore it seems obvious that I must, that I must, that I, I, I cannot, I cannot. I am the vision of the Avengers. I saved the world 37 times. It's so creepy and gets this nature of when something horrible happens, no matter what the scenario is, when, when something terrible happens to someone, there is this primal unnerving urge for revenge. If a member of your family dies, you it's totally one of the most human things to want revenge for that. And so not only is he not getting that, the man who is responsible for killing his son is being held by the people that told him that put him in the situation to do that and yet visions under house arrest and so like there's no logical way to break down what he's feeling beyond that is just how he feels and the thing is if you're in that that intense emotional place it doesn't matter that there's no logical way to break it down everything seems reasonable to what your solution to what you want is in that moment and so he is just lost and it's scary man Vision walks into Viv's room and sees her kneeling on the ground praying. And this is just another heartbreaking ass scene that is very, very strange. Oh, excuse me. It is fine, Father. I have yet to start. Oh, yes, of course. Well, if you've not yet started, may I then join you? Yes, Father, you may join me. I am praying for Vin's soul to be at rest. I see. I do not know if there is a God. It seems unlikely. Yes, it does seem unlikely. I also do not know if Vin had a soul. That, too, seems unlikely. Yes. So first I pray that there is a God. Then I pray that Vin had a soul. Then I pray for God to allow Vin's soul to rest. If that order is satisfactory, Father, then perhaps you'll follow me. Yes, Vin. Yes, Viv. That will be fine. Please let there be a God. Please let there be a God. Please let my brother have a soul. Please let my son have a soul. And please, God, let my brother rest. And please, God, let my son rest. Amen. Amen. So what you have going on here is vision dealing with the the stages of grieving um in almost like a systematic logical way and that's not something you can do right you can't
you can't logically break down what it means to grieve, what it means to feel enraged. It's just these are our emotions at the back of our head. And Vision is not a machine 100%. He is, he has some level of biology to him. He's a synthesoid. And so that's why he differs from Ultron, right? But... he still doesn't have the proper context because his brain thinks differently. So he doesn't have the proper context for how to deal with these emotions. And so it's just this horrific sense of denial and then followed by this intense form of bargaining that he knows is worthless. And then you get the big moment, which is that he's not able to to just deal with stuff. And then, of course, I mean, just the absolute worst. Vision takes out one of his eyes and sets it down and has it play something that happened from his memory banks. And so hologram of his dead child appears father you must hear this part then i am on a call with the avengers not now father listen then it is vital that i am on this call just it will take mere seconds listen how like you the young german the duke of saxon's nephew very vividly in the morning when he is sober and most vilely in the afternoon when he is drunk. When he is best, he is little worse than a man, and when he is worst, he is little better than a beast. And the worst fall that ever fell, I hope I shall make sh shift to go without him. Well, Father, what do you think? Is it good? Am I good? I am sorry, I could not listen. As I noted, I am on a call. And then he just turns it off and puts his eye back in and sits there alone. He, he, he looks at this memory of his son as he ignored him. And this is where we get the, the line that gives each volume its title, volume one, a uh, little worse than a man, Little volume two, a little better than a beast. When he is best, he is a little worse than a man, and when he is worst, he is a little better than a beast. And it just continues to get so fucking emotional and sad and scary. So Vision decides to go get revenge and kill his brother, as it were. Uh, and so... Vision goes to fight the Avengers. I understand that due to his role in the death of my neighbors and my son, actions undertaken under your supervision, Victor Mancha is being held here in the Arlington Courthouse Jail. I am here to visit Victor in his cell. Then I will kill him for killing Vin. I would greatly appreciate your cooperation in this matter. However, I do not require your cooperation in this matter. And then he just fucking trashes the Avengers without effort. And it's intercut with Vin, or God, sorry, Viv being told by Virginia 
about why the situation they're in is the situation they're in. So more heartbreaking stuff. As Vision just tears through the Avengers without any kind of problem. And Virginia kills the family dog. And then as Vision goes to finally get his revenge, the last minute, a red hand comes through Victor's chest, rips out his mechanical heart, and it's Virginia. So Virginia basically takes responsibility, says that she reprogrammed her husband and caused him to do this before she starts the process of committing a slow suicide, explains it all to her husband, and he says, then it will all be in vain because I will tell the truth that I did it myself under my own free will. And she says, no, you will not because you need to protect our daughter. And then she fucking dies in her husband's arms. And it is literally the saddest possible thing it could be. It is just horribly sad. And so Vision is left with his daughter, and he watches her take off for school. as he also plans on creating his wife. I would not call this a happy ending in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> God, has Tom King done a happy ending before? I would definitely not call that a happy ending. Um, I think this cover is rather poignant. Um, What do you do? Hold on one sec. Hey, Haley. Yeah. Um, no, wait. It wasn't. Never mind. Ignore me. Hold on, Haley. Will you hand me my cell phone, please? All right. Give me a moment. I'm gonna do something that is so effing professional. Okay, let's see here. I'm going to call my mom on air. What's the question? It's a question only she can answer. What's the question? She is the only one that's going to be able to answer it, Haley. You're not going to know the answer, which is why I didn't ask you. <laughs> okay, let's see if I can get through to my mom. You guys can hear that? Yes, no? Hear the ringer? <laughs> You've reached Mary Lou. Oh, boo. Couldn't get through to my mom. Oh, okay, so like a couple months back, my niece, my mom was taking care of my niece, and she dropped super glue into her toaster, and it broke, ruined the toaster. So what I wanted to ask my mom was, did she keep the toaster? Did she throw it away? And I know the answer to the question is she threw the toaster away and got a new one.
you can't do that with a loved one. If someone you, if your son or your wife dies, you can't throw the old one away and just replace it. If you are in a relationship and you get married and the person you married dies, you can get remarried, but they're not a replacement. If you lose a child, you can have another one, but it doesn't make you even Steven. And that is just horrifying. This is so unnerving in so many ways. Ugh, what is this life? <laughs> just wow. That's a hard thing to read. That is just like a really scary and unnerving thought and it adds such a level of creepiness and heartbreak um dr holocron asks is this book in canon yes yes this is still in canon uh and it's weird because king's not writing vision anymore i don't know what people are doing with this with with like Viv Vision is taken off as a really popular character. Cool. I'm glad. Um the fuck are the implications after the fact? <laughs> Jesus Christ. Oh man. Oh man. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna go out with with just this. Just gonna gonna stream that for a couple seconds, and I think I think this is the appropriate way to end this broadcast. Just gonna do a loop of this for a minute or two because this is just terrifying, y'all. I just don't know how, what what feelings I even have anymore, and it's creepy, creepiness, creepy, creepy, creepy. All right. Everyone, thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed this episode. I don't know how I felt about it. <laughs>